So in our very last module, yay, we're going to talk about intelligence. Um, so we're going to end on sort of what makes people um, either intelligent or um, not intelligent and really looking at intelligence theories over time. Um, and so most people believe it's genetic and um, there's been a shift from single types of intelligence to multiple intelligences. <clears throat> So thinking about what is intelligence, um, most people all argue it's being smart. And then after you think about it for a little bit, you're like, well, not always. Just the being smart, right? And so how would you measure that? Well, I can give people a test, but uh, that doesn't always work either, because if they don't know, um, if they haven't had any exposure to the material, they could be smart, but they just don't know that stuff. So intelligence from the beginning has sort of been a tricky topic to, to cover because how do you measure something you just sort of feel like, well, they're just good at stuff, right? <clears throat> so during the 19th century, uh, Galton was the first person to really start to explore this area. And his argument was that intelligence was the byproduct of just an extraordinary sensation cap capability. So you just have good senses. Whereas Whistler in 1901, said that sensation was sort of uncorrelated with school performance. So this is all about men, remember, in this time period, men are the only ones going to school. Um, and so it was, well, it's sensation. They're good at sensing things. And then somebody was like, no, no, no. That has nothing to do with how well they're performing in school. So what next? In the 1920s, <clears throat> a group of people got together, mostly in France, uh, and said that intelligence was the following four things. Your, the ability to abstractly reason, the ability to adapt to novel environmental circuit, uh, circumstances, um, <clears throat> which is sort of the street smarts, um, or any kind of new cir uh, circumstance, the ability to acquire knowledge, the smarts, and the ability to benefit from experience, so learn from your mistakes, learn from um, previous experiences, uh, and not repeat the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> So the French government really was the reason that uh, intelligence research became so popular because they decided that uh, they wanted to uh, track children. So they want to be able to put, you know, the slower learning group into their own special class so that there could be uh, a special uh, curriculum and then fast learning groups like our honors system into a different class so they could cover different things instead of mixing everybody together. So um, Binet, like the Stanford Binet, was the first person to make an intelligence test. And it's continued to be one of the most popular intelligence tests, um, with one or two exceptions. <clears throat> so what Binet gave people was a test where they had to name objects, uh, list word meanings, so it's both the smarts, drawing pictures from memory, uh, completing incomplete sentences and constructing sentences that were incomplete. Um, so if I have these three words, what would the next part be? So all this really seems to measure um, the smarts part. Not so much a little bit of abstract reasoning, um, and, but not so much the novel environment component that um, originally was part of intelligence um, definition. <clears throat> so what Americans do as we tend to think of intelligence as the, uh, our reasoning thing, so the ability to reason and to learn, so to be quick on one's feet, and a separate one, being the smarts, so um, being able to learn a lot of information, so expertise. And that overlaps with the original definition um, with reasoning and the, the, the smarts part. <clears throat> And so to finish the thing on definitions, it's sort of interesting that uh, reasoning has always been part of the definition for um, intelligence. So every, most people believe that it's partially knowing a lot of things, but also the ability to reason. And then when we get into definition um, uh, research on intelligence, you'll see that pop up again. <clears throat> so with um, with studying in this area, there are two big fields. The people who argue that it's a single ability. Intelligence is a single pool and we um, just use that single source. Uh, and that tends to be called G. So Galton, Spearman, and Cattell. 
And then we have people who argue that it's actually multiple abilities, so there's different types of intelligences, and that's more Gardner and Sternberg. Um, there are other people in these fields, but these are sort of the big names. <clears throat> so let's talk about Galton. That sensory thing didn't correlate with uh, school performance, but um, intelligence tests sort of correlate with some sensory uh, abilities. And what Spearman really did was he took Galton's ideas and he said, okay, it's G. G for general intelligence. <clears throat> um, and the, the, if they all sort of correlate, that Im implies that that's one big intelligence thing. And then he said, oh, well, okay, maybe, maybe not just one, but there are some individual factors, and that's S for those specific factors. So it is a general thing, but we also have some, uh, some smaller specific factors, <clears throat> which is sort of cheating, but he's still saying it's a single ability. <clears throat> and so um, after some fancy statistics factor analysis, um, what they did was they showed that abilities are correlated, and they tend to group into two separate sort of factors. Um, and this is a really common um, way to view intelligence, where it is these two separate factors. And this is Cattell's research. So there's fluid intelligence, which is our ability to reason and learn new problems. And there's crystallized intelligence, which is the, um, the accumulated knowledge of the world over time. And so that's the definition the American way, if you will. It's um, the smarts, that's crystallized intelligence, and the ability to reason, which is the fluid intelligence. Uh, when we took the Raven's progressive matrices in the problem-solving section, that's a fluid intelligence test. <clears throat> so our ability to um, solve those problems. Um, so one thing people think... Uh, Americans anyway, is that um, we, as we get aged, we sort of get, not dumber, it's not as a terrible term, but um, we tend to lose intelligence. And so if you uh, study in this area, what happens is it's not really that you are getting dumber, but your ability to reason does slow down. So our fluid intelligence declines with age, and that's a general slowing of all of your cognitive processes. So it's not really that um, your IQ goes down, it's that your ability to do a lot of cognitive things just declines because you're getting older. But crystallized intelligence actually keeps going up with age. So you'll see one of them sort of goes down and the other one goes up because you're just getting more experiences. <clears throat> so. Um, that sort of American myth uh, is not true. <clears throat> so why did we think that people were getting dumber with age? So why is that something people believe? Well, what people did was they studied IQ using cross-sectional design. So cross-sectional designs take one snapshot of people at different ages. So I get somebody who's 10, 20, 30, 40, 80, 80. And if you look at IQ, traditional definitions of IQ, um, and a cross-sectional approach, you get this sort of picture. Okay, and these are um, averages. I just made this graph up, but you do get this sort of curved picture. And so what's happening out here is it looks like, come on now, people are just getting, um, lowering their IQ. Uh, and what's really going on? So if you think about the people who are 80 now, okay, that's mostly women, because uh, we do live longer, and if they're 80 now, it means they were born, a little bit of math here, in the 1930s. Would they have gone to school? No. Um, and so what you're really seeing when you take a cross-sectional approach um, is looking at people who are 20 and trying to compare them to people who are 60 who've had completely different lives. So people in their 20s now grew up with the internet, um, which is a totally different type of generation than people who are in their 60s now. Um, the baby boomers. So um, cross-sectional approaches suffer from what's called a cohort effect. Um, and I think that's on the next slide. Nope, sorry. So it's a cohort effect. Uh, and what that is is that different um, generations have different things that influence their lives. So the type of life that a baby boomer has had is completely different from the type of life that a millennial has had just because of technology, what's going on in the world, wars, that sort of thing. Um, so studying cross-sectionally doesn't always give you the best picture of um, mental capacity because of all these other environmental influences. <clears throat> 
So looking at a more multiple intelligence approach, um, the single intelligence approach is more popular um, because of a lot of the uh, research has shown that it really does break down into reasoning and um, the smarts. But some popular theories for multiple intelligence <clears throat> uh, come from Gardner. <clears throat> and he suggests that there are eight different intelligences. You don't have to learn them. And he was looking at autistic savants. So um, what is it about these people that have, they have these amazing intelligence abilities, but a lot of their other um, abilities like social interaction are lessened? So here is eight. <clears throat> Uh, linguistic, people who are really good at language, uh, mathematical, so people who sort of get math, spatial abilities, people who are good at um, manipulating objects in their environment, musical, bodily, kinesthetic is athletic, interpersonal, those just friendly people, uh, and then naturalistic. So these are like things that you just think people are good at. And that sort of suffers from the problem that a lot of these are tied to reasoning. So, um, or just learning things. So, uh, you know, there's some support for this, but not a whole lot. <clears throat> uh, Sternberg's theory is another big one. It's a triarchic model. And he says that there are three types of intelligence. It's usually drawn as a triangle. Um, analytical, analytical intelligence is the reasoning one we've been talking about. Practical intelligence is um, the street smarts of this. And then creative intelligence is the um, sort of creativity, the ability to come up with um, novel solutions and effective answers so they're a problem solver. <clears throat> um, and so this actually does not include the smarts component. What you get are the, it um, explains how some people are just uh, are really good at m manipulating their environments. So if you think about um, drug dealers, like, like the sort of famous case ones, or like um, bank robbers like Dillinger, they had this sort of street smarts ability. So most people wouldn't argue, well, they're really brilliant. They would argue that they were brilliant at that task. So that's what practical intelligence is trying to get at. People being um, intelligent in problem solving versus your more creative types um, being um, better at being sort of artistic. <clears throat> Computer does not like me. There we go. The problem with Sternberg's theory <clears throat> is that a traditional intelligence test does not really cover practical intelligence. Um, it covers more of the other two types of intelligence. Uh, and probably because practical intelligence isn't really separate from the idea of a G factor, an intelligence pool. <clears throat> so we're going to support the single intelligence theories, arguing that's actually two, but that falls into the like single component theory. <clears throat> so where is intelligence in the brain? What, what part of the brain is that? <clears throat> and if you guess prefrontal cortex, good guess, because the prefrontal cortex is everything, right? <clears throat> so if I look at brain size, it's only weakly correlated with IQ. So they're talking about uh, Einstein's brain, it's only slightly larger than the rest of ours. And usually it's the prefrontal cortex because that part of your brain just does so much. Okay? And that's because intelligence is linked with working memory and attention, which is in the prefrontal cortex. So if you look at gifted children or what are traditionally labeled gifted children, they actually have slower cerebral cortex development. Now this is the whole brain. And what that means is that the myelination is actually a little slower. Um, and so you'll see children who seem abnormally bright, but their brain actually is developing slower than a normal child. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> it's kind of this idea that um, if you're smarter, your brain has to lurk, work less hard. And so just like in problem solving, as, uh, as you are getting closer to the problem, you get less and less activation. So you actually see less brain activity in gifted people because the brain is more efficient. So that development might be a little slower because it's organizing itself better and requires less effort. And when you have to do less effort, you're getting less practice. So the brain just sort of is slower to develop. <clears throat> so looking at what is IQ um, versus intelligence. 
So IQ is a number we attach to intelligence that we sort of made up a system for uh, comparison points. Uh, so it's called the intelligence quotient. Um, and this has had several different definitions across time as well, um, just like the definition for intelligence. So in, the, in 1912, intelligence was your mental age. So what age were you at um, divided by what age were you actually times 100. So if you were 10 years old and you acted like a 10 year old, your IQ would be the average, which is 100. Um, that works really well for grade school children. Uh, not so well for, um, let's say, some of us that are in our 30s. So if I acted like a 40 year old, but I actually was 30, what does that mean? Right, so as you age, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. It works pretty well for, um, for grade school, for high, uh, up to high school, but it doesn't really work past that point. So we've moved on from that definition. So Wexler, <clears throat> in the 1930s, <coughs> um, looked at how much your IQ deviated to your same age peers. So this gets rid of the cohort problem of um, people in their 20s and people in their 60s just have different lives, and looks at how what's your intelligence compared to the others at that same level. So this is kind of how the GRE works. Um, it gives you a percentile rank based on other people who've taken it at the same time as you have. So it sort of gets rid of that age problem or time of test problem. <clears throat> so the average IQ is 100. The standard deviation is 15 points. So 70% of people, it's actually 68%, are from 85 to 115. So most people are in the that range. <clears throat> if you want to join Mensa, you have to have an IQ of 132, which is two standard deviations above, and that creates a nice pretty bell curve. So we have forced that on, um, on the, it's like the, the system that we've made up to be able to, again, compare and to, um, to sort of look at how many people fall in each area. <clears throat> so this is the original, one of the original bell curve books. Um, and so this is the picture of how it looks. So most people are here in this 85 to 115 area. Sorry, I'm terrible at drawing. And then you see the average is actually um, slightly over 100 in this example, and then you've got a smaller number of people out here on the uh, mental retardation end, and then more people, and some people up here in the genius area. <clears throat> okay, so it creates a bell curve. Um, <clears throat> and this might be kind of tiny to read, so you might have to blow it up on your computer, but this is an example of the WACE, which is the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale is a very popular scale to use now. It's slowly passing up the Stanford Binet in popularity to give to people. There's also the WISC, the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. Um, so there's different ones for adults and children. And what you'll see is that it's got several different um, types of components. So there's comprehension questions, there's arithmetic questions, uh, digit span, so there's a working memory component on here, vocabulary, and um, your general fact-based knowledge. And then you can look at the uh, types of scales they have, especially for children. So there's picture completion, put this thing together. There's uh, digit symbol tasks, which is like the Raven's progressive matrices. There's object completion. There's create these blocks, so a working memory component. And so it's really measuring reasoning and smarts. <clears throat> so Stanford Binet, one of the most popular ones. Stanford bought it. That's why it's called the Stanford Binet. Uh, then there's the WACE and the WISC. Um, most people in my age have taken the Stanford Binet on um, grade school. And then I think now they're slowly moving towards the WACE because it just, uh, it, it's a better, or the WISC rather, it's a better, um, it, it does predict better uh, grade school performance. <clears throat> so some other problems with IQ is that um, there is a language bias and sort of just a bias in general because most IQ tests are made by uh, rich white men. So um, we're trying to eliminate the fact that um, the language is an issue and uh, culture. So they're called culture fair tests. So you've seen the Ravens before in the problem solving section that is supposed to be um, um, sort of unbiased test. 
there are some standardized tests like the SIT, the ACT, the GRE, so the alphabet soup <clears throat> that correlate pretty highly with IQ scores, but those are still tend to be biased um, because they're created in English. <clears throat> so what happens? IQ is pretty stable across your lifespan. Um, so if you get tested as a kid, you get tested as an adult, the fact-based knowledge will go up, but the reasoning ones tend to stay the same. Uh, it does predict school grades, but not at the very top. So children who score in the genius range um, will, all, will show a strange variation in grades because even smart people are lazy. Um, so if you are at the very top of a scale, it doesn't necessarily always predict your school grades because um, there are other environmental factors playing a role there. <clears throat> So mental retardation, there's a couple different um, names for this. I th this is probably the most common way to talk about it. Um, there's mental handicaps, there's learning disabilities. So there's lots of uh, different things, but um, uh, with learning disabilities, it um, you can have normal IQ ranges. So you kind of have to keep them separate, so we're just gonna call it mental retardation. <clears throat> Um, and since that is, we're arguing that it's genetic, so it's before adulthood, it's an IQ of less than 70. So it's an impaired adaptive function. Mild retardation is that 70 to 85, where um, uh, that's where most people fit in this, ca in this category, the strange spot in the middle. And you generally see um, you're going to regular school. Below 70, you're going to a special school. So there's lots of causes for mental retardation. There's fetal alcohol syndrome, Down syndrome, Fragile X, uh, Williams syndrome, we talked about before, uh, and those tend to be genetic as well. <clears throat> so it is tied to your genes. On the other end, there's the genius. And so uh, Turbin was one of the first guys to study a lot of these students, and um, this is 130 up. Um, you see it change a little bit, 132, 135, but it really is 130 up. <clears throat> and Terman's findings were that um, kids who were in the genius category, so men, because this is still 1960, um, were uh, above average health. They were taller, as if being um, really smart made you tall, <laughs> and all these other, they were uh, considered... Um, more attractive, all these other things. Uh, they tend to be successful in adulthood, big shock, right? The higher your intelligence, the more options you have available to you. And that they had lower rates of mental illness. That's a pity that a lot of this was very biased in his study. And really the only one that sort of sticks is this uh, highly successful in adulthood. So there really aren't any health taller things involved that aren't tied to environmental ability. So if you um, are successful in adulthood, you're making more money, so you have more money to take care of yourself. And this lower rates of mental illness is a, a big fat lie. Um, you have the same rates of mental illness at the top as you do in the middle and the bottom. <clears throat> so I've been saying it's genetic. So um, siblings do have 0.5 correlation, so half correlation between IQs or higher. Um, some studies it ranges all the way up to like 0.9, so it just sort of depends, but 0.5 is kind of the lowest. Um, twin studies indicate it's somewhere between uh, 0.4 and 0.7, so that's really about half genetic, essentially. <clears throat> and people who sh who look at, so people who adopt children's um, IQ matches biological parents rather than their environment. So yes, it's part environment, but mostly it's genetic. <clears throat> and this graph is really old. It just is amusing to me. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep using it, but it is quite old. Uh, 94. So here is the line for an average intelligence, give or take my really terrible drawing abilities. And so they have people on this end, social scientists. Hey, that's me, college professor. Um, and medical doctors, all the way to computer, finance, and some high school teachers. So we're all up here in the higher ranges. <clears throat> so I think they were trying to show that um, jobs are tied to IQ. Not surprising, right? Um, but they have um, <clears throat> uh, 
craftsman, carpenters, truck drivers, sales, and others. So what you see is that there are these wide ranges of IQs within profession. And so um, even people who are right on the sort of normal levels, because this is where normal ends, right, at 115, at 68% of people, you still have a, a lot of different job options. So IQ isn't necessarily tied to profession, but you do see um, you see some professions with higher IQs than others, but you shouldn't be surprised. I do want my doctor to be very smart when they're treating me, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so what environmental factors play a role in um, intelligence? So there is this big thing on birth order that the, the different uh, being first versus being last causes all these different problems. So this is Zajonk's research. And his argument was that IQ decreases with um, with birth order, and a lot of that has been debunked. And it's not necessarily that your IQ decreases with birth order, it's that if you're having eight or ten children, um, you don't have time for all of them. So with the first couple, you have more time, with the last couple, not so much, because you've trying, got a lot going on. Um, there is, the correlation's fairly weak. And so some later studies really suggested that um, people with lower IQs tend to have more children than people in the higher IQ ranges um, due to um, not having enough access to birth control or just not knowing any better, that sort of thing. Um, schooling is tied to IQ. Now remember IQ measures a lot of the, the smarts knowledge. So the more school you have, the more smarts you're going to have just because you've had the ability to and access to learn a lot of new things. Uh, so it's also a 0.5 correlation. <clears throat> and uh, these early intervention programs, something like Head Start, which is such a great program, does produce some uh, changes in IQ. And what it really does is it gets children um, excited about learning. And then if they're excited about learning, they tend to do better in school, which gives them more of the smarts kind of knowledge. And that program does have a, a fairly lasting effect on IQ. <clears throat> All right. So who's smarter, men or women? What you see is that most of the time there is, people say they have the same IQ. So if you look at this graph over here, the average is the same for both groups. Okay. What happens is men have a wider distribution in IQ. I mean, there are more people out here in the tails Okay, oops, I didn't like that. Let me try this. All right, here we go. So there are more people out here on the tails of the distribution. So you have more people on the mental retardation side and on the genius side than you do women. Okay. And so what is causing this factor? Who knows? Um, it could be the type of test. It could be genetic. Not really sure why you get these distribution differences, but they're, they're pretty slight. So, and the average is the same. Okay. So women tend to do better on verbal tasks. So this women are better at talkers, men are better at space sort of thing, um, <clears throat> including spelling. But if you think about what women do during their day, so if you follow them around with a tape recorder, they do talk more than men um, by quite a lot. I mean, look at the difference here. 20,000 words per day on average, whereas men are more 7,000 words per day. So it doesn't surprise me that women are better at verbal tasks because we're just getting more practice. Men tend to do better on spatial tasks, especially mental rotation. <sighs> it's just one of those things. <clears throat> so sex differences is really tied to environmental cues. You have to also think about um, social norms. So this changes depending on the type of society you're in, the type of culture. Um, and I think a lot of the differences really occur because of, um, because of uh, gender norms in our society. <clears throat> so what about uh, ethnicity or race differences? <clears throat> so if you look at how people traditionally perform on, on a standardized IQ test, you do see that Hispanics, Latinos, African Americans score on the lower end. The whole test is made for Caucasians, so we're the middle. And then Asian Americans do tend to score a little better, <clears throat> and up to a whole standard deviation better. Um, and the original idea with the book called The Bell Curve was that the reason that 
the Hispanics and African Americans are on the lower end is be is genetic, is that they're just built that way, which is it just sounds awful to say now, like, oh God, that's so horribly racist. Um, but that was a common interpretation in the 70s. Now the interpretation is more this one on the bottom, where um, there are socioeconomic status differences in the United States for um, Hispanics, African Americans, and Caucasians. And so if you are in a poor income area, you are going to a school with less money, which is tends to make the school um, have poorer teachers because they can't afford to pay them, they don't have the supplies. Um, so there are lots of cultural reasons why you get these differences between races. Um, and um, you especially see that in, um, in big cities where you have these sort of pockets of, of different socioeconomic statuses and it's more tied to, to money than it is uh, race. And the other issue that you see is this test bias. So this is a lot of the work by um, LaBeouf and the argument that um, that language is really tied to IQ tests. And so what you'll see is that you have um, these sorts of patterns with IQ and GPA, right? So we're talking about a lower IQs here, lower GPAs. But if you look at, um, so this would be like African American on the left, over here on the right, you get, there's just like nobody down here, right? <clears throat> so um, what it is, is it's a bias for the fact that it, it's written in standard American English. And um, LaBeouf's argument was that black English vernacular is um, more efficient and useful, but it doesn't help you in school because they're, they're doing standard American English. And so most people tend to think um, that children who speak in this black English vernacular are just sort of dumber. So then you treat them differently too. So there's culture and there's language tied all together um, when you're talking about IQ tests who are written by white men. Okay. So to sum all of this stuff up, um, intelligence are the definition really is about reasoning and um, and um, crystallized intelligence, how much how much we know. And then, um, so there have been several different definitions, but that's kind of the final product of all of those. People argue, is it a single ability or multiple abilities? And then lastly, uh, looking at what is influencing IQ. So it's mostly genetic, partially environmental. And then a lot of the differences you see between men and women and different races are tied to the environment more so than genetics.